viewers, the childhood memories are always nostalgic. We all love to cherish them forever. Torozit was one such young poetess who added a charm to her childhood memories and made them immortal through her wonderful poem called The Casuarina Tree. Now let's try to know more about this great poetess. She contributed a lot to the world of literature in a very short span of time. Torozit was born on March 4, 1856. And she was youngest of the three children of a high caste Hindu couple in Bengal. His father, Babu Govind Chandar Dutt, was himself distinguished among his countrymen for the width of his views and vigor of his intelligence. His only son, Abju, died in 1865 at the age of 14 and left his two younger sisters to console their parents. Aru, the elder daughter, born in 1854, was 18 months senior to Toru. She was born in Calcutta on the 4th of March, 1856. With the exception of one year's visit to Bombay, the childhood of these girls were spent in Calcutta at their father's garden house till November, 1869. After which, Toru and her sister Aru travelled to France, Italy and then England. She went to a school in France for the first time of her life and cultivated an intimacy with French during that period. After the publication of several translations and literary discussions, Toru and her sister published Sheaf Gleaned in French Fields, a volume of French poems she had translated into English. This volume was brought out by Saptahik Samvad Press of Bhavanipur, India in 1876. Eight of the poems had been translated by her elder sister Aru and this volume came to the attention of Edmund Goss in 1877 and reviewed it quite favorably in the examiner that year. She would see a second Indian edition in 1878 and a third edition by Cajun Paul of London in 1880. But Toru lived to see neither of these triumphs. Toru paid her debt to nature, leaving her parents totally deserted and depressed at the age of 21 on 30th August 1877. And she left behind her an imperishable legacy. She lived and wrote at a time when cultural studies were at an incipient stage of development and the idea that mythologies hold the key to understanding people were not properly realized. She was one poetess who made us realize that the great Indian mythology is the very base of human psyche and Indian culture. With her amazing insight into things, Torudit realized the importance of Indian myths and legends. She instinctively realized that Indian poetry to be truly great must be inspired by Indian myths. Her collection of poems, ancient ballads and legends of Hindustan reveals how evenly shadowy figures of legends can come alive when romantically treated. At the time of her death, she left behind two unpublished novels. La Journal de Mademoiselle de Avers, thought to be the first novel in French by an Indian writer. And Bianca for the young Spanish maiden, thought to be the first novel in English by an Indian woman writer. In English, in addition to an unfinished volume of original poems in English, ancient ballads and legends of Hindustan. Look at the variety of literary chunks she contributed to the great world of literature. As for Torudat, she rendered several French poems into delightful English verse. Thus, she interplayed the culture of her land with that of England and France. The noted French critic and writer James Darmistetter makes a correct evaluation of Thorudath when he observed thus, this daughter of Bengal 
so admirably and strangely gifted, Hindu by race and tradition, an English woman by education, a French woman at heart, poet in English, prose writer in French. Toru was in fact a citizen of the world and not of any particular race or community. Now let's take a quick look at the summary of this beautiful poem and I'm sure you will also remember your childhood through this great poem called Our Casuarina Tree. Now this is a poem by Torudat, taken from her book Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan with an introductory memoir by Edmund Gossi. The poem gives an objective description of the tree and the charm associated with the poet's childhood. It begins with an account of the giant tree with a creeper wrapped around it like a huge python. It is the center of the busy life of birds and beasts. The tree is depicted as grand and charming. It has become dear to the poetess because of the memories that surround it. Memories of a time when they are as happy as children played under its shade. The thought brings out an intense yearning for the playmates who are now no more alive. For their sake, the tree has become an immortal memory to the poet's joyous past, which the cruel waves of time had swept away. The last stanza unfolds the desire of the poet for the immortality of the tree. A simple tree like Casuarina tree, it has enriched the imagination of this young poetess and she has immortalized her thoughts so beautifully that it has remained on the minds of the readers forever. In the poem, the poetess celebrates the beauty and the majesty of the tree. She uses the medium of the tree to receive her memories of the past. The poet attempts to recapture the happy time of her childhood in the company of her siblings Abju and Aru. She immortalizes those glorious moments of happiness by recalling the memory of the tree. The emphasis goes beyond that one tree. The poet delicately recaptures the past and binds it to her present. The tree has been made immortal by Torudat. Our Casuarina tree a poem by Thorudath is one of those most representative poems. The poem reveals the influence of Keats on her. The first two stanzas are imaginative and sensuous description of the Casuarina tree replete with imagery taken from nature. These two stanzas confirm to Milton's conception of what poetry should be simple sensuous and impassionate. Both the tone changes to melancholic reflections in the third stanza. Torudat explains why the Casuarina tree is so dear to her, not because of its magnificence, but because she, her brother and sister, both of now are dead used to play together beneath this great tree when they were little children. The image of the tree rises in her memory till her eyes become dim with tears. The Casuarina tree becomes an objective correlative from the fourth stanza onwards. It is a symbol of her brother and sister's memory. She can hear the wailing of the Casuarina tree wherever she goes. It follows her to distant lands and she can hear its plaintive music even in the distant shores of France and Italy when the waves gently kiss the shores beneath the moon. The tone of the last and the fifth stanza of the poem is definitely one of triumph. Triumph of immortality over death, loss and oblivion. The Casuarina tree will remain immortal and it will keep alive the memory of her dead brother and sister, though her own poetry is too weak to confer immortality on them. Love will defend her dear ones from the curse of oblivion. The poem 
reflects her deep felt admiration, affection and desire for the tree, which is freely linked in her mind to her homeland. When she was abroad, Dutt longed for her native land and the one symbol of all those memories in her mind was the casuarina tree. The casuarina tree belongs to the she oak or beef wood type of trees and is mainly found in southern parts of India and Australia. It is somewhat similar to the birch tree and its total look resembles to the plumage of cassowary bird from which it has derived its name. The tree in Thorudits R. Casuarina tree stands for the motherland with its giant stature. It is indented with scars that has been inflicted by the past trials and tribulations. The rugged trunk hints at the antiquity and culture. The tree reaches for the stars and represents the aspirations of millions. The python like creeper stands for the cultural invasion that the country has faced. The symbol of the python represents an objective outlook as foreigners have always viewed India as a land of snakes and magicians. It gallantly wears the culture with dignity. It accepts the invasion of the creeper and utilizes it as an embellishment or scarf that enhances its appearance. The gathered bird and bee emblematize communal activity in India as it is a conglomeration of various cultures and religions. As creeper climbs in whose embraces bound no other tree could live. By these lines, the poetess signifies that no other country could have absorbed these foreign elements and yet maintained its own identity. What a beautiful way to remind the readers to remember their own roots and not to forget them or get carried away by foreign culture. The python like a scarf as an embellishment and protective cover that only enhances its dignity. The symbol of the scarf may also refer to the concept of modesty in Indian culture where the femininity of a woman is synonymous with modesty. Flowers are hung in crimson colors all the bow along. Crimson is a bold color and it is a color of festivity. The bird and bee and their songs represent the rich natural vegetation. Lines like with one sweet song that seems to have no close underline the rich cultural tradition that fails to die away. It exists even while men repose. It lends the speaker an inherent delight as she opens her windows to look at it at dawn. A beautiful time to admire nature and its eternal beauty. It is also an abode to the animal world as the status baboon resets on it at winter and a source of amusement to the offsprings as they play on it. Symbolism, it has a special place in the world of poetry. And Thorudith used this device of symbolism very well and especially in this poem, Our Casuarina Tree. The tree is both a tree and a symbol in it are associations of two important elements, time and eternity. The first stanza is an objective description of the tree. The second stanza relates the tree of Thoru's own impression of it at different times. The third links up the tree with Thoru's memory of her lost brother and sister. The memories of her siblings always haunted her throughout her short life. The fourth stanza humanizes the tree for its laments are human record of pain and regret and the last stanza wills as it the immortality of the tree. The eleventh line of stanza form with the rhyme scheme A B B A C D D C C E E is worthy of 
commendation. The poet's childhood with her siblings have deep associations with the tree. Since they are no longer alive, their memory is more poignant. The poet wants to make the tree immortal like the yew trees of Borrowdale sanctified by Wordsworth in his poetry. In the poem Our Casuarina Tree, Toru refers to the scene of her earliest memories, the circling wilderness of foliage, the shining tank with the round leaves of lilies, the murmuring dusk under the vast branches of the central casuarina tree. She bought with her from Europe a store of knowledge that would have sufficed to make an English or French girl seem learned. But in her case, it was simply miraculous. Immediately on her return, she began to study Sanskrit with the same intense application which she gave to all her work and mastering the language with extraordinary swiftness, she plunged into its mysterious literature. But she was born to write and despairing of an audience in her own language, she began to adopt it as a medium for her thought. Very rarely we come across such great personalities who recollect their roots and work on them. The poet, while living abroad, was pining for the scenes of her native land and was reliving the memories of her childhood. In the first part of the poem, the poet depicts the casuarina tree trailed by a creeper vine like a huge python winding round and round with the rough trunk sunken deep with scars. It reached to the height touching the summit near the stars. The casuarina tree stood alone unaccompanied in the compound wearing the scarf of the creeper hung with crimson cluster of flowers among the boughs occupied by the bird and the hives of bees humming around. At nights, the poet's garden overflowed with the sweet songs of nestled birds while tired man took rest in its shade. The poet recalls when at dawn she used to open the window of her room, her eyes rested upon the casuarina tree and derived a strange kind of delight. This shows how deeply she was in love with nature. And often in the day of winter, she happened to see on its crest a grey baboon sitting stunned and alone like a statue. O oh, sweet companions, loved with love intense, for your sakes shall the tree be ever dear. To the poet's imagination, the tree in sympathy makes a sound like a dirge, funeral song or an elegy, like the sea breaking on a shingle beach, the eerie speech, unnatural, strange and peculiar. She thinks may happily reach the unknown land and strike a chord of memory there. Such a veil had always this power over her own mind. Even when hurled by the seashore in France or Italy, it had always sent her thoughts winging its way, hopeward, bringing remembrance of the tree as seen and loved in childhood. The last verse of the poem with its note of romanticism hints at a desire for immortality of words and ends with this beautiful line. May love defend thee from oblivion's curse. The eleven lined stanza in which the poem is written is a new and very successful experiment. Though the poetess fills or pen this poem with her rich imagination, she never failed to capture those subtle details which added to the richness of this poem further. The poetess gives us minute details of the occupants of the tree and how they enjoyed their stay there. The birds used to wait for the sunrise and its puny kids leapt about and played on the lower boughs. Early in the morning, 
The sleepy cows were led to the pastures and on the way they passed by a broad pond under shadowed by a whole tree. The pond was covered by overlapping and overspreading water lilies flowered like the sheet of snow. Look at the beautiful comparison, lilies and sheet of snow. The poet here reveals why the casuarina tree was so dear to her soul. It was because she played with her sweet companions and friends whom then the cruel waves of time had scattered them like the loosened leaves and she could not see any of them again. Only the sweet memories were left behind. Though they were sweet, yet they were so painful for those poignant hours which cannot be fetched back. The poet grew up, but the memories of the sweet moments stored in her mind were still young. The tree is dear to the poetess because it is the soul born between her past and present. When she calls it, a chain of pleasant and poignant memories come to her mind. There are other poetic devices that were brilliantly used by this young poetess. This poem is romantic in tone and contains autobiographical reminiscences. The first two stanzas scrutinize the tree objectively. The very first line of it with its image like a huge python conveys the massiveness of the tree. Its grandeur is in its height and age. The rugged trunk indented deep with scars up to its very summit the stars. The tree is a source of life and wears the scars of the creeper with casuarina flowers. Birds and bees gather here and the song of bird at night is endless and sweet. The second stanza moves from the objective description of the tree to the impact it has on the poet narrator whose eyes delighted on its zest. Again, the power of observation and the selection of the detail instill the poem with interest. The gay baboon which sits statue-like while its puny offspring played the coquillas hailing the day, sleepy cows mending their way to pastures and water like snow and mast. The delight on seeing the sight makes the poet nostalgic about her childhood. This may be taken as evidence of her romantic muse. While the tree stands as a symbol of nature's magnificence, it is dear to the poet's soul because of the sweet companions whom she remembers playing beneath the tree. A personal reading would justify the sadness of hot tears for her childhood playmates. So great is the grief of loss that it seems the tree also laments with her. This sonnet has been considered as beautiful poetic pieces, the outbursts of poetic genius. It is a memorable poem. It is an admirable blend of local touches and literary reminiscences of objective description of the actual tree and the charm of association with Toru's childhood. To the poet's fancy, the tree in sympathy sounds a dirge like murmur, like the sea breaking on a shingle beach. It is the eerie speech or lament of the tree that she hopes may perhaps reach the unknown land. Such a vein always strikes a chord of memory in her. Even when she was traveling in France or Italy, it had always sent thought winging its way homeward, bringing recollections of the poem with its rich romantic fervor and it unfolds a desire of the poet for the immortality of the verse and ends with the delightful line. And what is that line? May love defend from oblivion's curse. This poem is written in 11 line stanza form, rhyming A B B A C D D C E E E. It is certainly a new and very successful experiment and is worthy of Keats. In the words of Dr. Iyengar, 
in the organization of the poem as a whole and in the finish of the individual stanzas, in the mastery of phrase and rhythm, in its music of sound and ideas, our Kajurina tree is a superb piece of writing and gives us a taste of what Toru might have done and not the race of her life being so quickly run. This is again little tragic. As you all know, she died young, but before that she transferred all her richness of poetry to this great world of literature. The poem is more than the poetic evocation of a tree. It is recaptured. The tree is both a tree and a symbol and it is implicated both time and eternity. The tree in Toru that's our Kajurina tree stands for the motherland with its giant stature. It is indented with scars that has been inflicted by past troubles. The rugged trunks hints at the antiquity of the culture. The tree reaches for the stars and represents the aspirations of millions. The python like creeper stands for the cultural invasion that the country has faced. The symbol of the python represents an objective outlook as foreigners have always viewed India as a land of snakes and magicians. It gallantly wears the culture with dignity. It accepts the invasion of the creeper and utilizes it as an embellishment that enhances its appearance. The gathered bird and bee depict communal activity in India as it is a conglomeration of various cultures and religions. The poet signifies that no other country could have absorbed these foreign elements and yet maintained its own identity. It wears the python like a scarf as an embellishment and protective cover that only enhances its dignity. The symbol of the scarf may also refer to the concept of modesty in the Indian culture where the femininity of a woman is synonymous with modesty. The flowers are hung in crimson colors all along the bow. Crimson is a bold color, a color of festivity. The bird and bee and their songs represent the rich natural vegetation. Lines like, with one sweet song that seems to have no close, underline the rich cultural tradition that fails to die. It exists even while men repose. It lends the speaker an inherent delight as she opens her windows to look at it at dawn. It is also an abode to the animal world as the statistic baboon resets on its winter and it is a source of amusement to the young ones as they play on it. Dear viewers, I hope you enjoyed the array of colors that have crept into this poem and which have enriched your imagination. I hope Torudat will remain on your young minds forever. Thank you.